Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. By way of introduction, my name is David Nye, and I'm the Major Airports Manager at the Australian Airports Association. Today, for technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1800 733 416. If you would like to listen to this webinar through your phone instead, please dial in the number and passcode that is listed in the chat box. Today, the AAA presents the webinar Pavement Thickness and ACN PCN, presented by Greg White, Director of the Airport Pavement Research Program at the University of the Sunshine Coast. This webinar is the fourth of a series focused on airport pavements for regional airports. Today's webinar will cover the following topics the background and requirements of pavement thickness determination, empirical and layered elastic design tools the ACN-PCN system and its importance to airports, and setting a PCN value and pavement concession considerations. The opportunity to ask great questions will also be provided. Uh, to ask them a question, please use the chat box, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen, just to the right of the cog wheel. After typing out your question, hit enter to submit. Uh, Greg will um, endeavor to answer questions as we go or, or at the end. Um, We'll, we'll play that one as we are. And um, before we start, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Greg for his participation today and the webinar. And without further ado, um, we'll begin. So over to you, Greg. Morning, all. Thanks, David. Uh, it's always uh, always a bit of fun. So happy to uh, happy to be here. Um, as David says, this is uh, the fourth in the series. We talked about airport pavement basic stuff in uh, August last year, talked about asphalt and bitumen late last year and we talked about spray sealing uh, earlier this year and so as we progress forward we'll probably talk about friction and, and skid resistance sometime towards the end of this year and then uh, the last in the series will be about maintenance. And as always uh, this, this presentation is based largely on the applicable chapter or content from uh, Apple Park. Practice Note 12, Ethical Pavement Essentials, and draws on a little bit of information as well from the supplement to, to that document, the regional airport supplement that was uh, recently, recently launched by the AAA as well. Um, important to uh, just to note that this isn't about turning us all into airport pavement designers. Um, really the intention is to provide an understanding of the basis and the limitations of air, airport pavement design um, rather than explain the mechanics of physically doing those designs. Um, and then probably more importantly the ACN PCN system which I put on my list of, of uh, top four or five issues that I get a lot of questions about, particularly from regional airports who either don't really understand the basis of the system or, um, or get lost in, in trying to administer it. So it's really about trying to, uh, to provide a bit of help on those two fronts. Um, so starting with the principles, as always, we'll focus on flexible pavements. Um, many of these principles also relate to concrete or rigid pavements, but because we're focusing on regional airports in these uh, webinars, then um, we're really talking about flexible pavements. And the job of any pavement is to protect the subgrade, so the soil underneath, the natural material, for want of a better term, sometimes improved, sometimes replaced even, but generally that material, that weak material underneath. And so all of pavement design is about how much stuff do I need to put above that natural material to protect it from the planes that I expect to stick on top of that pavement. And if I had a, a, a wonderful, perfect subgrade, I wouldn't need any pavement. I could stick the plane straight on them, but in practice that's never the case. I need to put something on there um, to spread that load out um, and to spread the load to the point that it's not going to damage the subgrade or the, the underlying soil any more than I can be comfortable with it being damaged. 
and the second part of what a pavement does is provide a safe surface which means quad free and, and enough friction um, and we've talked about friction or we'll talk about friction and uh, skid resistance in a different webinar and but it's important to note that designing the surface isn't directly part of pavement design, certainly not from the perspective of today's presentation. And I, I quite often say, think about the strength of the pavement as being equal to the sum of all the layers, stiffnesses and thicknesses. So you can have a very stiff material that's relatively thin, and it will provide the same contribution from a strength perspective as a very thick material that's not as stiff. And if you add all of your layers up at their different stiffnesses and their thicknesses, um, then two pavements that have effectively the same sum across all of those layers will effectively have the same strength. But you know, don't take any of that literally um, because you can't really do that thickness times stiffness math and get the same answer. But the, the principle that if you make it stiffer, or you make it thicker, you'll overall increase the strength of your pavement. Um, and, and you can then therefore easily make lots of different pavements that are quite different in their composition, different materials and different thicknesses that have the same overall strength. Yeah, and that's really the, uh, the job of the pavement designer is to work out how strong it needs to be and what's the most appropriate or economical or um, reasonable combination of stiffnesses and thicknesses for that particular environment. This is a bit about how, um, how a flexible pavement um, reacts to a load. You put the wheel on the top, everything deflects. That's very exaggerated, of course. Um, the asphalt spreads out that load quite quickly because it's quite stiff. The granular material, the base course and the sub-base, spread the load out further, but at not as great a rate. Um, so to achieve the same amount of spreading, you need a greater thickness. And we get to the bottom um, where the subgrade or the natural soil is, and hopefully by then we've spread that stress out or that load out enough that, um, that the critical stress calculated usually directly under the wheel um, at the bottom of that pavement, at the top of the subgrade, is going to be lower than what the subgrade can handle. And so that's really how our pavement's working. At and what it's doing for us. So moving from the principles into how we might empirically or based on um, based on observation of other pavements of similar composition, how we might go about designing a, a pavement. When you certainly with current softwares and tools, calculating the stresses and the deformations within a pavement is, is quite easy to do. Um, it's, it uses a bit of mathematics and it makes a lot of approximations, but it's relatively straightforward. The really hard bit of pavement design is working out how many times that, um, that level of stress or that level of deflection um, can actually be repeated before the pavement is what we define as failed or at the end of its life. And that's the really hard bit. And you can't do it with science and you can't do it with, with theory. The only way to do that is really to test a whole bunch of pavements under different conditions and different thicknesses and then observe how many times you can repeat a given load and then draw a trend or a line of best fit through all of those results. And that's what they did when they first wanted to develop a, an, a pavement design method. They built pavements, they loaded them, um, and they looked at how many times they could repeat the loading until a thing failed. And they created a little database and drew that line of best fit through it. And here's a picture of the chaps that, uh, that originally did that. And in the background, they were, they're standing, some of them, are standing on the tyre that they were using to actually, to actually do um, the loading and they're standing in front of what's um, commonly known as the Stockton Test Track which is in California in the States and that's where they built some pavements as consistently and controlled as they could and then loaded them up and down and counted how many times until that, their pavements failed. Um, and even to today we rely on the results 
with some additional results collected in the meantime. But we rely on the results that those chaps collected and the line of best fit that they drew through those results to, uh, to design our pavements, regardless of how sophisticated our softwares are, they've all got those relationships built into the back of them. Here's another picture and you can see that that's sort of a, a two or three metre deep excavation. There's, a, um, there's a, a, a chap just standing there in the middle of that hole inspecting the, the prepared subgrade before they built the pavement on top of it. And, and that's another one of those test tracks at, at Stockton. In the 1990s, in preparation for the introduction of the A380 and other aircraft with six wheel, six tyres on their landing gear, which had never been considered in, uh, in, in those original tests, the FAA in the United States built this wonderful facility inside a shed. They've built six or seven cycles now of flexible and rigid pavements, um, and they have supplemented those original tests to include new materials, new technologies, the, the newer wheels, bigger wheel loads, higher tyre pressures, and a whole range of other things that, um, that have progressed or, or changed since those original test pavements were built. And, and every now and then, you'll see a presentation on you know, the FAA has released a new version of its software. It does this instead of that, or it adds this much thickness, or takes this much thickness off, or, or whatever it may do. It's as a result of adding the test results from this facility to the test results from the original pavement testing um, in California and, to, and it's the changing of the line of best fit that is then reflected in upgrades and iterations of, um, of the various softwares that we use to design our pavements. So it's all what we call empirical, which means that you know, we can calculate a stress in the pavement, but we can't relate that to number of repetitions. We need some form of full-scale or large-scale testing to rely on um, to generate a line of best fit, which is effectively a, a, a real-life relationship between the magnitude of the, the stress or the load and the, and the number of times it can be applied before the concrete cracks or um, upgrades rut, pavements rut. In the olden days, you know, before computers were on everybody's desktop, um, those results were re best represented in graphs. Um, and so for a long, long time, um, for a long, long time, the graph-based versions were, were what pavement designers relied on. They were for 5,000 coverages, so 5,000 actual movements of the tyre over the top of the surface and of a particular aircraft or a group of aircraft, and there was a lot of manual manipulation to sort of convert the aeroplanes I've got into the aeroplanes that, um, that the chart is based on. With the advent of computers and the prolifer proliferation of very simple and quick software, there's a whole bunch of Software is available these days. One of the probably the original one was the FAA's Comfa software. It's still the official ICAO um, method for calculating aircraft ACMs, which we'll talk about later on. But it also contains the current version of that purest line of best fit without any manipulation or without any factors of safety being built in. Um, of the empirical relationships between the stresses or the loads and the number of repetitions that can be accommodated. And because of that, a lot of other design tools are actually calibrated to, to the relationship that's built into Comfa. A um, couple of questions. One is about can we get the presentation? Uh, there's always a PDF that is present of the webinar presentation circulated by the AAA after, um, after the event. So yes, Mark, absolutely. It's always the case. Um, the other question is, are we planning on discussing the effect of pavements from different aircraft loading regimes? And um, for example, the difference between landing impact, slow moving taxiways and those. Um, remind me if we don't come back to that. We won't explicitly cover it, but it's a good point. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end, Doug. So don't let me forget, please. 
um, whilst the Confer software is, is terrific and certainly in advance on the chart based methods, there's still some limitations and one is that it's certainly in the original versions of that software, you could only consider one aircraft at a time um, and all of the aircraft wheels are effectively considered to fall on top of each other, so equidistant from the centre of the aircraft. And the thicknesses that Comfort produce are actually a standard thickness, so yeah, it's got a specific amount of asphalt and a specific amount of crushed rock, and then the rest is made up of uh, natural gravel subbase. So if you want to have a pavement that is of different composition, say a regional airport with no spray seal, and you don't want to have natural gravel, you want all fine crushed rock, you have to use these things called material equivalence factors to sort of make your pavement using that whole idea of you know, strength equals stiffness times um, stiffness times thickness, and you can calculate equivalent thicknesses and therefore an equivalent pavement that um, is about the same strength but of different composition than, than the pavement thickness that Compa has generated, so it's a bit more manual manipulation. Here's an example of, um, of how it works, and just very quickly, we you know, pick here, very, very simply, pick a Boeing, pick a 737-800, um, make sure that we've selected the thickness mode, and we always tick the metric box because we're not American. Press this button here for flexible, uh, after nominating a CBR, upgrade CBR of six, and it very quickly tells us that you know, 797.2 millimetres of that standard composition of pavement is required for 1,200 departures per year of that particular aircraft. And there are a few other variables in there, but you know, by and large, that's a pretty good place to start in terms of pavement thickness design. And moving on from that into weight elastic, which you would call you know, the normal, normal standard or, or the normal approach in the in the current day and age. Um, in the in the lane elastic design tools, generally the computer is doing all of those things that we had to do ourselves manually. So the equivalent materials. Um, and the combining of different aeroplanes to come up with an overall pavement structure. Um, it does all that for us really, really quickly um, and, and saves us a lot of manual, manual work and manipulation. There are a number of tools. Uh, the FAA's LEGFA, which has now been replaced by their current tool called Farfield. And in Australia, we've made use of APSDS, which is um, an airport specific version of the software Circly that was developed by um, an Australian called Lee Wardle in the 1970s as part of his PhD. He developed all the mathematics that goes on in the background to, to do all that stress calculation. And, and he developed APSDS and with a couple of other chaps and some help from our you know, everybody's good friend Bruce Rodway uh, in the 1990s to, um, to help or to, to provide an, an airport specific version of that software that's very, very common in the Australian road industry, certainly. Um, the somewhat misleading part of these softwares is that they'll give you a pavement thickness to 0.01 of a millimetre or any number of decimal places that you choose to calculate. And uh, I always tell people that uh, you know, that's, um, that's orders of magnitude better than the empirical relationship that is built inside and um, so just because the software now calculates pavement thicknesses to a very very high level of precision doesn't mean that the actual answer is any better or any more reliable than the answer that we would have got from the old chart based methods which probably would have reported pavement thicknesses to you know, plus or minus 25 millimeters or something like that they usually think that if you're within 25 mils of the true number then, um, then you're probably doing all right when it comes to pavement thickness design. And of course, these softwares, they can't calculate how many repetitions of the load, so they have to be calibrated to the empirical database. And that Compa software 
is, is usually the most convenient way of doing that. One of the real beauties of the Light Elastic software is that they can give you um, the, the, the predicted damage to your pavement by lots of different aeroplanes at lots of different locations. And this is a typical output chart that you get from the Australian APSDS and you can see there each of the lines represents a different aeroplane and then the, the green line at the top represents the, the combined effect of all the aeroplanes. And this is the centre line of this particular pavement and this is eight metres offset um, from the centre line. So you can see here clearly the 737, which is this blue line, puts all its wheels at about two and a half metres from the centre line. Whereas the 777's wheels are out here, and to a large extent the 777 damage and the 737 damage are, are almost, um, well they're not on top of each other. Um, and so you're getting some spreading of that load across the full pavement. Um, and then when you add all those things together, you find that this spot here is the critical, the critical distance and that the 777 is doing the vast majority of the damage to the pavement and consuming most of its life out of all the aeroplanes in that mix. And so that's, that's one of the real um, conveniences of, uh, of the layered elastic software is they give you that kind of level of information about which planes are doing what. When we put together the, um, the supplement to the to the Airfield Pavement Essentials practice note, um, one of the things that we generated to put in there, and I, I supplemented this from a similar table that Bruce Rudway generated some years ago, was just some simple pavement thicknesses, typical pavement thicknesses calculated by CONFA for different aeroplanes um, and different CBRs. So CBR5 might be a decent clay, CBR10 a gravel, CBR15 a really strong soil um, and then thicknesses for different planes such as a light plane, um, a refueling tanker and then right down to the 737-800. So if you're a regional airport and you're currently accommodating Saab 340s, you might have 350-ish millimetres of pavement um, which incidentally isn't enough to accommodate a large refueling tanker but maybe that's what you've got. Um, and so you could quickly say, well, if we were going to start operations of a 737-800, we'd need to find, well, we'd need to more than double the thickness of our, of our current pavement somehow, or otherwise strengthen it by stiffening up those existing materials, maybe by stabilising them or something like that. Um, so it's just a little table to give, give some kind of idea of the kind of pavement thicknesses you might expect to be needing the different uh, different aeroplanes and, and different circumstances. Uh, going back to the compa thicknesses, they're, they're based on generally 10,000 coverages. Um, we talked about it being a single aircraft uh, and that there is that standard pavement composition. Probably that slide would have been better a couple of slides earlier, but um, anyway, we got, uh, we got there in the end. But that's really all I, I had on pavement thickness um, and as I said it really wasn't about turning people into pavement designers, it was more about just giving you an understanding of why pavements are designed the way they are and, and how that works and what some of the limitations uh, and the pros and cons of weight elastic versus the, versus the more traditional um, approaches. Before we move into ACN, PCN, um, we'll try and answer Doug's question and just to remind ourselves, um, different aircraft loading regimes and in particular the difference between the landing impact, slow moving planes, taxiways and, and things like that. Um, good, good question. There's a common misconception that um, the most damaged part of the pavement should be where the plane touches down because we've got that big dynamic loading effect. Um, but uh, particularly in um, flexible pavements where the surface is bituminous, um, so asphalt or a spray seal, and particularly in asphalt, the, the duration of loading is very important. So if you just push something very quickly 
and then let it go again, it will spring back and generally be be reasonably comfortable. Um, but if you put that same load on there and you leave it there for a long time, the load can creep into the material and the material will relax around the load and you will get far more damage occurring than if you load it very quickly. And because of that, actually the landing impact of aircraft, even though you've got that big dynamic thud, um, is, is not as damaging to the pavement as the slow moving loads, particularly associated with you know, taxiways and aprons, aprons in particular. Um, where the plane will sit stationary for maybe an hour, maybe a whole day, um, whilst the poor old bitumen in the top of the pavement is both hot and being loaded for a very long time. The other important difference between um, runways, taxiways and aprons is the concentration of the traffic. Um, so on a runway, plane to landing, they'll have a much greater variation of their alignment across the width of the pavement, it's still centred around the, the runway centre line, but certainly there's a lot more distribution laterally of the load application. So the, the, the damage is being spread out over a bigger, bigger area, um, whereas on the taxiway, the, yeah, they're pretty good at following the taxi lines, um, and they're very good at parking right on the right spot, um, and so you'll get Almost no variation in the, in the point loading of the uh, of the aircraft wheels um, in, in those environments. So you get a lot more loading and a lot longer loading, um, which is why, if you think about it, um, you, you, we tend to build certainly at our bigger airports. We tend to build our runway out of flexible materials, um, and we tend to build our aprons and in some of the bigger airports the taxiways out of concrete pavements, mainly because concrete doesn't suffer that same temperature and load duration um, damage, that uh, doesn't suffer the same damage from the load duration and the temperature that the, that the asphalt does. Uh, Steve asks, how far below the pavement is the subgrade CBR calculated? Um, that's a, a, a Good question, and whether it's on top of the fuel or under the fuel, that's an excellent question, um, and we'll probably talk all day about that. But in general, you would expect that the top half a metre to one metre of subgrade is important to your pavement design. Um, and whilst it's not very convenient to test it all the way a metre down, um, that's the sort of the depth that you might think of as important, and below that, you might just accept that by then the stresses will be so low and so spread that you don't really need to take them into account anymore. Um, probably the exclusion to that are uh, airports that are like Brisbane, like Cairns, that are very poor clays, which then have some metres, a couple of metres, maybe three metres of sand fill dredged out of an ocean um, and put on top of the on top of the um, on top of the clay to to protect it because the clay is a really 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 poor material and so in that circumstance um, it would probably be common to consider two upgrades you might consider the clay underneath the mineral clay uh, the marine clay very poor material as a very very low subgrade uh, low CBR subgrade. And in, in, in that case, you might consider the fill, the sand fill that you've dredged and put in there as a, as a fill layer at the bottom of your pavement. But then you might say, but I've also, I can't just protect that material. I've also got to protect the sand because the sand's not as good, as good a quality as crushed rock or other pavement material that you might build your pavement out of. So you might then do a second design using the sand as the subgrade, and it would have a much higher CBR than the, than, the, than the clay at the bottom of the pavement, the true natural material, but it wouldn't be as strong as the pavement material. So you might end up with two designs, and the thickness difference between the two designs would tell you the minimum thickness that your, um, that your sand fill might need to be. 
and uh, I think the Sunshine Coast Airport, who are currently building their new runway and putting about a metre and a half of sand fill over some very poor clays, um, not as poor as the marine clays at, uh, at Cairns and Brisbane, but, but not far off. And I think they would probably have done the same thing there. They would have had two designs, one for the existing natural material and, and one for the sand fill after it's fully fully compacted and, uh, and built. Hope that answered your question, Steve. Um, ACN, PCN, but if there are any more pavement thickness questions, we can always come back to them a bit later on. Since the 80s, ICAO has mandated um, every airport to publish a, or every significant airport anyway, publish a PCN for its runway. And it's essentially an advertisement of your pavement strength. It's usually based on a technical assessment, but really any airport can set it to any number they want. But if you set it high, you will increase the damage to your pavement because you will effectively invite bigger aeroplanes to use your, use your runway. And at the same time, if you underrate it, you'll unduly limit your operations um, or you'll get a whole bunch of pavement concessions across your desk. Either way, might not be ideal. So the ACN-PCN system isn't about safety. It's not really about preventing catastrophic pavement failures because pavements very, very, very rarely catastrophically fail. Um, it's really about how quickly you consume your pavement design life um, and giving the airport the ability to make a decision about whether they allow it to be overloaded and therefore be consumed more rapidly or whether they choose to um, maintain the original design life and expectation by not overloading it but therefore rejecting larger aeroplanes from using it. So it's really a tool, it's, a, it's purely a tool for the airport to make those decisions. And I won't dwell on this too much, but you know, it's a quite a long quite a long thing, this PCM thing, but um, you know, the 46 there is, is a Sunshine Coast Airport example. That's the, the key number that we compared to the ACM. F just tells us it's flexible instead of rigid. B tells us that it's a, it's a subgrade category B, which is normally a CBR10 type material. And, and then the tyre pressure limit, which we could argue about all day, but it's usually either a number in Australia, the rest of the world uses W, X, Y and Z categories. And the T at the end just tells us that it's a, a technical assess based on a technical assessment as opposed to being a, a usage based assessment which is really just saying I'm going to set it to the ACN of the aeroplanes that use my runway every day which if they've been doing it for a while it is not necessarily invalid um, but not as uh, if you like engineeringly robust as the technical assessment would be. Just a couple of things that I find people aren't necessarily aware of, but, but should be, is that you'll have a different ACN for an aircraft on a flexible and a rigid pavement, and that's because of the way, different ways flexible and rigid pavements work. So it's because a particular aircraft's got an ACN of 30 on a flexible pavement, it won't have an ACN of 30 on a rigid pavement, so just be conscious of that. Um, and that they change, the aircraft's ACNs change with the subgrade strength. And that's because the thicker the pavement, um, oh, sorry, the, the weaker the subgrade, the thicker the pavement will have to be, which means that there's more distance for two wheels to interact with each other and the effect of those two wheels to combine rather than being felt separately as they would be in a, in a thinner pavement. So again, an aircraft's ACN might be 12 on, um, on a on a subgrade category A, but it might be 15 or 18 on a subgrade category D. You just need to again be conscious that um, that those numbers are specific to certain conditions. We talked about the technical versus the usage, um, and it's really a note as much for anything to, to allow the airport owner to know with confidence where their PCN came from. Um, 
doesn't really make one's no more or less correct than the other. Um, it's just that uh, you, you might consider a technical assessment more, more robust than a usage based assessment. And it's just useful to know which one of those you've got. We won't talk too much about tyre pressure links today. They're important at the big end of, uh, of the airport town as uh, bigger and bigger aeroplanes keep being introduced, but um, less of an issue at the regional airport. Um, regional airport pavements. Pavement concessions are an important, important topic. Uh, when the ACN exceeds the PCN, um, the ask for a concession. You also should be a concession should be sought if you exceed the tyre pressure limit um, for the for the for the airport of, of interest. And usually granted because you know, another landing means a few more bucks in the bank account. Um, there have been some cases where politics has got in the way and people have said, no, 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 that plane's landing because he's very important, so just get on with it and make it happen. Um, and there's usually some caveats around damage being um, being rectified by the operator of the aircraft. But it's always important to remember that a pavement concession is an overload, so you're overloading your pavement, which means you'll consume a larger amount of its life than a regular operation would. And as the ACN increases more and more, then the damage increases um, quite rapidly. And the next chart shows that. So along the bottom here, you've got the ACN-PCN ratio. And as you'd expect, when the ACN-PCN ratio is one, the, the damage caused is one unit of damage. But if you just go just to ACN-PCN ratio of two, then the damage caused is either 40 or 80, depending on how many wheels the aeroplane has in its landing gear. But let's just, even if we concentrate at the one and two wheel aircraft, which are more applicable to regional airports, then by doubling the ACM, we've increased the amount of damage done to the pavement by 40 times. So if your pavement was designed for 10 years life, structural life, and you started operating it with aeroplanes where the ACN ratio is twice what you designed it for, then your pavement would fail in three months, um, according to theory and pavement design science. Uh, it might not fail in three months, but, but it very well may as well, um, because for every one of those operations, you've consumed 40 of your expected operations worth of the pavement. And so you turn up to an airport and you don't know the PCN and you've got to set it, how do you do it? And you can go down the usage based approach, which is look at the common aeroplanes ACM, make sure the planes with those ACM values aren't causing damage and simply set your PCN to the ACN of the common aeroplane. So that's a, that's a very practical approach and there's nothing wrong with it. The, um, the, the, the trick is to make sure that those aeroplanes aren't causing any damage to your pavement. And because that damage is quite difficult to see, it's going to be quite difficult to detect if that's the case until it, it's too late. Um, the alternative is the technical assessment where you essentially have to reverse design your pavement. So instead of saying, here are my aeroplanes, here's my subgrade, what pavement do I need? You can say, Here's my subgrade, here's my pavement, what aeroplanes can I accommodate? And then set the PCN equal to the ACN of whatever the planes you can reasonably accommodate are. Um, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. The trick is you have to understand the thickness and the materials that your pavement is comprised of, which if you don't have very good and reliable records will require some significant amount of relatively expensive geotechnical and investigation testing. When people ask me how much will this cost, a technical PCN assessment, I always tell them um, it's not the cost, it's the significant portion of the cost won't be in the time taken to do the reverse design um, by the engineer. The, the significant cost will be in collecting the data about your existing pavement if you don't have it readily at hand already.
there's been a um, an increase in recent years of using the falling weight deflectometer to survey pavements, and, and we talked about this in quite a bit of detail at the uh, the recent pavement workshop in association with the uh, with the Opswalt in May, I think it was. And and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this isn't a useful device. I use them all the time, but I don't use them to directly calculate PCN, which there are some softwares that will now take the falling weight deflectometer results and turn them directly into a PCN. Um, we had a little go at doing that. Oh, there's a falling weight deflectometer being used, incidentally. You, you drop a weight of known over a known height of a known weight. You measure the, effectively you measure or estimate the deflections at each of these distances from the load application. And, uh, and then that gives you an idea of how much the pavement is deflecting um, under that particular load. And, and it's those deflections that have been related to um, PCN values. A student last year who, um, who looked at what happens if you, if you like, reverse design a pavement um, properly to calculate the PCN, and then you use a, um, a, a falling weight deflectometer survey to directly calculate using some software uh, PCN values. And this is what we came up with. Um, green line was sort of the line of best fit and what I recommended to the airport based on reverse design. And you can see there that um, and the blue and the yellow line, depending on the model that you put into the, the little software, you, you, you're getting an extremely high portion of the of the falling weight deflectometer derived values falling below that, which effectively means if you use that falling weight deflectometer approach, you are most likely to significantly underrate the strength of your pavement and therefore perhaps unnecessarily limit um, limit the strength of, of, of the pavement um, and therefore its use. Uh, that's to a large extent, the um, the end of the material we talked about uh, the uh, pavement thickness design and, and how it works and where it comes from. We talked about uh, the, the ACN PCN system. So uh, only a couple of questions today. Um, so unless there are some some more questions, um, we can. Oh, look at that. We're already there. I would have uh, had a little summary at the end, but that's okay. We talked about those two things. Um, the most important um, aspect was. Uh, to, just to remember that the, the ATM PCN system isn't a safety thing. It's not an official tool that CASA requires. It's really there for the airport to manage themselves. And also remember that um, no matter how sophisticated and precise a pavement thickness design might appear to be, it's only as good as those full-scale test results that, uh, that are in the background um, that you don't necessarily see in the software and and they're never as accurate or as reliable as the level of precision that you can theoretically calculate a pavement thickness to. Um, but yeah, if there's no more questions, then then that's all I had. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think that there are possibly a couple of questions that have just come through. Uh, one from from Jessica. Um, how should airports take into account the impact of overloading the runway when it comes to budgeting? That's a good question too. Um, I guess in theory you could do it. You could take that chart and you could say that a particular overload based on ATN, PCN ratio was going to consume three bits of your pavement life, three times as much as a normal operation. And you know, I guess in theory you could charge that airline three times the uh, three times the landing fee perhaps. Or you might you perhaps if you had two airlines and one airline was overloading your pavement all the all the time and your other airline never was overloading your pavement, then I guess in theory you could look at um, you could look at uh, different rates or different contributions to future pavement upgrades, capital works to reflect those different uh, different frequencies of overload. And you know, there's probably some science in there that could help make that assessment. Um, 
but it would be it would depend very greatly on the relationship between the airport and the airlines, I suspect. Um, Thomas's question is confirm that unless otherwise published, we assume that a runway PCN is relevant to the taxiway and the apron service in runway. It's a good from question too. So um, you, ICAO require us to publish PCN for runways. They don't say anything about taxiways and aprons. And I, I think it's fair to say that the onus is on the airport or air traffic control at controlled airports that um, once the plane's landed, you've got to have a system that can get you from wherever you are to where you need to be. Um, and if you have a strong taxiway and a weak taxiway, then it's going to be up to either notes in the URSA or um, markings on the pavement surface or air traffic control to make sure that that plane goes the right direction. Um, but yes, without a doubt, you, you, your underlying assumption would be that the taxiway and the apron connected to a, to a runway are going to be as strong as the runway unless somebody tells you otherwise. That's a, because what else, you can't stay on the runway all day, can you? You, know, you go somewhere. Okay, thanks again, Greg. Um, I'll um, I'll just begin to wrap up, um, and that gives uh, another minute or so if there are any other questions coming through. So um, uh, everybody on the webinar, just still um, feel free to pop any questions through. Um, but in the meantime, um, thanks again, Greg, for a very informative presentation, and um, thanks to everybody online today um, for participating in the session. Um, we'd just like to ask you now to take a moment to complete a short survey that you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. Some people have already been on there and done that, so that's great. Uh, please ensure you hit the orange submit button once you've completed all of the questions. Um, as was said earlier, this webinar will be made available to members via the airport professional webinar page in the coming week. And we encourage you to provide feedback on any other topics that you would like to see covered by emailing us at events at airport asn.au. Further details of the next AAA webinar will be released in the next edition of Airport Alert. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, the link to register will be distributed by Redback shortly after um, that notification has gone out. Um, if you would like any additional information, please email us at uh, the AAA. Um, our events team again can be contacted on events at airports.asn.au. Um, today's webinar recording will be available in the airport alert and emailed to everyone directly once available. Um, so I haven't seen any other questions come through, so I'll take it that um, we're all all wrapped up there. Um, so um, once again, Greg, um, thanks very much for your time in uh, putting together the presentation and sharing with us um, your professional knowledge on this uh, uh, tricky subject, um, but one that um, we're all obviously in the industry um, need to know and uh, value uh, as part of our business. So um, on that note, uh, again, thanks very much everybody for participating today and to Greg and the Redback team and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.